look, we've increased the temperature of the planet one degree, probably another degree in the pipeline already. Uh, we're not going to, in any time soon, get rid of that excess heat. The question now is whether we're going to increase the temperature a further three or four degrees, whether or not we're going to take a what's already going to be a difficult century and make it an impossible one. Uh, new data from, say, Stanford and the University of Washington make it clear that we'll see shortfalls in grain yields of 30, 40, 50 percent with those kind of temperature increases. I'd say that's a pretty good definition of impossible. Uh, 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 it's, you can't imagine a world that works with uh, that kind of shortfall in calories. When we think about agricultural systems, the first thing we've got to figure out is what happened. I mean, 100 years ago, 50% of Americans were farming, and now that number is under 1%. I mean, there's twice as many prisoners as farmers in the U.S. And the basic thing that happened was we substituted oil for everything else, right? For labor and judgment and, and everything else. We just applied fertilizer and drove huge machines, and, and it kind of worked, at least if the goal was to uh, supply calories. Uh, it didn't work so well for building rural communities, in fact, it wrecked them. Um, um, but as we are no longer able to use fossil fuel in those ways, either because we're running out of it or because we've realized the danger that it presents to the atmosphere, well, we're going to have to start um, figuring out again how to get some people back on the farm. And it's one of the great opportunities for creative employment that we have going forward. Uh, I, where I live in Vermont, uh, the Intervale Farms in the center of Burlington on about 120 acres now grow uh, 7 or 8 percent of the food supply for our major city. So not, it's not a pilot project, it's a significant thing. And on that 120 acres, they make money and they have about, at the height of the growing season, 50 or 60 people working there not the one person per 300 acres or whatever the Midwest average is for farming. Um, it's a different vision and a much more humane um, and powerful one, and one I think we're going to move more and more towards. First of all, 20,000 acres is a really impressive and important number and big enough to make a serious statement. And uh, it'll make a huge difference in how we think about local food. We've got to start taking it out of the boutique scale and on not to the industrial scale, that's the problem, but uh, into the middle, into farms that are big enough to grow food at uh, not at sort of cut rate Walmart prices, but not at you know high end white tablecloth restaurant prices either. Uh, in the middle. And that's really what we've lost more than anything in this country. We need the processing facilities that we've largely lost in this country. Uh, we need new ways of thinking about how we're going to eat. So, for instance, uh, good, strong, grass-fed livestock turn out to be a very different creature when it comes to um, greenhouse gas emissions, say, than the feedlot corn-fed beef that we're used to. But because you have to keep them moving and pastured and things, that food's inherently going to be more expensive and it requires you to start eating it the way that people around most of the world eat meat as a kind of condiment, a kind of flavor to the food that they're eating. Uh, all of this goes hand in hand. 20,000 acres is big enough to really start to see many of those changes uh, play out. CSA models, farmers market models, what we call carbon farming, where people are really working hard to improve soil and hopefully being paid some small uh, amount for that work as they're doing rotational grazing of livestock or whatever it is. There may be room for some biomass cropping there too uh, for energy purposes. I, I don't know. Um, but real possibilities for all kinds of things to be going on. Well, I, my sense with many farmers is that they know that current models of farm economics and things are causing them to 
grow in ways that they don't really approve of, and that they'd much rather leave farms that look different to their children or whoever will inherit them. And that the idea of a real partnership between eaters and growers, uh, uh, between neighbors, as it were, is a much more attractive thing in the long run all around than the kind of trying to please the uh, commodity food stream, which is what we've been doing for the last 50 years. That's perilous business, you know, and anybody, any farmer who's managed to survive is obviously wily and uh, has their wits about them. Um, but um, the possibility of a much more neighborly system, um, one much closer to what farming has been for most of human history in most places, I think is awfully attractive to an awful lot of people who really care about the land. Interdependence is a good thing, right? In all kind, I mean, it would be a poorer world if we only could eat things that grew in Northeast Ohio, you know, or whatever. I mean, I did a pro I did a project a few years ago where I didn't eat anything for a year that didn't come from my valley in Vermont. But I made what I called the Marco Polo exception, you know, anything that someone could have carried in their saddlebag back from the back from Asia. So I was happily using curry powder and pepper and whatever, uh, and more power to it. And on a wider sense, it makes a lot of sense to be linking our food supply regionally to, you know, the, the, the point is to get most of it and most of what we need coming from close to home. We are going to have to figure out in a world with much more extreme weather how to do the sort of um, kind of insurance and things that not just provides financial wherewithal, but physical wherewithal if there are places that are caught short. And human beings are pretty good at that kind of thing, and we should be able to figure that out, especially since we've got this great tool, the internet, to help us now. Uh, that's a real advantage that people didn't have 100 or 200 years ago. Um, we can trade information very, very easily, exchange ideas, exchange reports on conditions, exchange uh, needs, you know, if there are places that are short and hurting. Um, that's a powerful tool.